And our guests in this segment from WVU Medicine, Teresa McKay. Hello, Teresa. Good morning. And uh, Dean Thomas, too, CEO. Good to see you, sir. Good morning. I think this is our first time having you in studio, correct? That's right. Well, welcome in. Uh, everybody who comes in uh, to the studio for the first time gets a free rate on test kit. <laughs> wow, that's very handy. <laughs> it is. Uh, just mention Eric Householder's name on your way by the health department. Today or or get anybody's name <laughs> here, or don't even say anything. No, nope. free today so. and today only. You mention Eric's name, and that's you get a free right. Rate on that's test. right. Today and today only. Uh, Maria. Uh, I think you got shorted on the questions the last time around. Uh, be, I, between would me I and ever Bill. be shorted <laughs> by um, by my fabulous co-host? Thanks, no. you, you're not being facetious, that Maria. You're, I that was, not. That was a, yeah, so, I am not. But so. you usually go to him first, so now I'm unprepared. So you go, Bill. How about that? You go. Oh, okay. All right. You, you want to defer? I'm deferring to the second half. I'm coming to the second half. I'm going to take the. She wants to kick the, off in the second. I'm going to kick off in the second. All right. I'm going to. I want to go first then because I was okay. just being polite with Maria. But Bill, you wait your turn. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, while you're here, I want to ask you a couple questions about certificate of need. While we have you in the building, because that's been such a hot topic of discussion in the Capitol. Uh, when we talked to Delegate Householder, who's the House Majority Leader, he said uh, maybe a couple of skinny bills about it, but uh, no sweeping overhaul. Of CON. I'm sure you guys follow this closely. Teresa and Dean, your thoughts on what you've been seeing in Charleston regarding this? Sure. Well, a lot of activity in, in this area, as you know, and I think you know the WV uh, Hospital Association mm -hmm. is opposed to, to removal of the CON. We support that as well. There are some aspects of what um, they're working on currently that are interesting. I think one aspect of a bill is to allow hospitals to expand within their within their their uh, campuses, which mm -hmm. without um, having to go through the the uh, steps of a CON application. That I think we will support. I, I think that would be very helpful for for us and for other hospitals across the state who want to make you know minor to to. To major modifications to better serve their communities without having to go through so much uh, regulation to and, do that. So to currently expand your physical footprint, you've got to uh, readdress the certificate of need? Oh, you've got to go through an incredible process. And I think most people don't really understand that. I, I they think that it's just, okay, we have one hospital or, and one hospital's enough. And so if it's a it's if it's the point of, you know, let the let the market do what it will bear, but I don't think people understand the process that you have to go through um, whenever you want to do basically anything yeah. with with it. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Uh, yes, it it is a big process. It's it's expensive. We have to use outside, you know, consultants and, and legal help to to go through an application. It it's time consuming and it, and it's expensive to do. And it certainly slows a project down. You have to factor that in to, you know, six, nine months of, of additional time to really address the, the CON application component. Now, that's to expand your footprint. If you're doing something internal to a building, such as going from uh, single room beds and you're in the hospital, do you have to do a CON for that as well? I believe in the four walls, you, you generally do not. Okay, but if yeah. you're going to expand square footage, yeah. For example, we're looking at a project right now where, where we need to expand our perioperative space and we need to come out onto the first first level of the hospital, um, an additional 10,000 square feet, something like that. And we have to get a CON for that. Yeah. So it's just part of our project. We've kind of factored that in. How much time does that generally take? It, it can definitely take six to nine months. We, we start the process very, very soon when we know we're going forward with a project so we can get that in the works. So it takes about six to nine months for approval? Yes. And then plus the construction angle of it. Right, months. that's just the approval cycle. I see. Yes. And who approves, who approves? Who's the, the ultimate decision maker? Um, I'm not entirely sure how that works, what, how, yeah. um, who, who has authority over that. That's, I believe it's the, it's the West Virginia Health Care Authority, mm -hmm. yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Maria, are you ready now? Yeah. <laughs> well, I sort of chimed in. Um, I chimed I in there. So. It was a very short first half. It was a short half first half. So um, talk a little bit, uh, if you can, about the Heart and Vascular Institute. That's, a, you know, obviously um, something uh, WVU Medicine very proud of, um, you know, um, uh, 
area of expertise that we were um, not missing, but that we didn't have the close proximity before. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would love to. I think that's that's a great um, a great story for us and for the community. Uh, just a, a, a few years ago, before my time, we we had only two or three cardiologists in 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 our system. Uh, turnover in that in those ranks and and just not a stable program. We now have eight cardiologists that that work um, across our WVU Eastern Panhandle locations. Um, we have started a vascular surgery program and we've started a thoracic surgery program. So really big um, additional service uh, service programs um, within the heart and vascular space for the community. We're also expanding um, the the Heart and Vascular Institute clinic space, they were in several smaller um, clinics kind of scattered across um, our campus. They are now uh, going to come into a much larger um, space on the first floor of the Dorothy McCormick Medical Office building on the Berkeley Medical Center campus. So that is expected to open in May. Um, and it'll be really great for all of our um, heart and vascular physicians and advanced practice providers to work together in one space. And you moved physical therapy out of that um, into a place on Tavern Road, correct? And they've completely made that move and, um, and so on. So just lots of expansion. There. Yes, lots of expansion. And, and we were really excited about that as well. Our physical therapy location, um, in the Dorothy McCormick building was very space constrained. They, we had a lot of demand for services and just didn't have enough space to to see all the patients that needed care. So they have a much expanded space in, at Tavern Road with the ability to grow in a couple more phases over time. So I think they're in a much better location for the growth for PT. And then we also have the room we need for, for the Heart and Vascular Institute. I had no idea, but my daughter, who's a physical therapist, um, got a little card from Raleigh Hospital um, saying that they were in dire need of physical therapists and they have a $20,000 sign-on bonuses. And I'm like, wait, you're not a nurse. Um, <laughs> so I, she don't want to move to Beckley, but that's a whole nother story. But um, talk a little bit about the nursing shortage and uh. what you're dealing with there, how many uh, travelers you have percentage wise. See, I got now four questions in. Yeah, and, and, I, and look, let me, before you, before you answer, let me expand on Maria's question because okay. I have something. You mentioned heart and vascular. We hear all the time about the difficulty in recruitment. Do we are we faced with the same level of difficulties in recruitment, heart and vascular nurses as we do in other fields? Uh, I th nurse nurse recruitment is difficult in in every specialty and subspecialty. So nursing shortage is 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 really very extreme. But to Maria's point, we also have shortages across physical therapists, mm -hmm. across lab technicians, across our radiology technicians, um, our cardiac cath lab um, techs. It's it's everywhere. So. So how competitive are we? You mentioned we went from two to four cardiologists, and I see that uh, uh, the, the the hospital complex is expanding in so many different areas. That implies that you are fairly competitive, uh, and why are you so competitive? That that's another great question. So maybe I'll start there and then we'll we'll pick it up on the shortages as well okay. um, in terms of uh, our compensation i think we we have done a tremendous amount over the last 18 months in improving the compensation and the benefits um, and bonus programs um, for for staff so we we've done a lot in that regard uh, we used to have um, a system compensation ph philosophy where essentially our pay rates were the same as as morgantown and that that made sense, at, you know, in the past, but it really didn't speak to the the um, the geographic kind of cost of labor that we see in our market. And essentially, it's locality pay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really all about the geography. And in our sure. case, uh, as as we've grown and our competitors have grown, essentially, what is affecting us here is Metro DC pay rates. I mean, that's that's what Valley is paying. That's what Meritus is paying. That's what uh, Anova is paying, and that that's effect, uh, affected kind of the pay that the, the pay expectations 
um, and and demands in our area. So we we ha put together um, a, a proposal, and ultimately the system accepted that. So that now the way the compensation is structured is there's a geographic amplifier for the cost of labor in your specific market, and so our rates are significantly higher than anywhere else in the system, which makes sense because we have the highest cost of labor. So since we put that in place, I think we're in much much better straits in terms of being able to compete for staff and offer you know comparable pay and benefits i think for every position across the board have you had any issues with peia and the reimbursement rates for state employees locally at the hospital here yes the rates are unsustainable they it just does not work it's it's as you probably know um peia pays in state inside west virginia providers extremely low but that same service across state borders they pay it's they pay much much higher two to three times higher what we would make for the same exact episode of care they they pay very well to our out-of-state providers and they pay our in-state West Virginia providers just extremely poorly and it's just not sustainable what progress has the legislature made we I've heard the governor address this a couple of different times about propping up the rates uh, have you seen an actual change in that? There's that so far just talk. I think that the that the legislature is is working very intently on 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 improving the rates. We have heard a proposal of 110 percent of Medicare as 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 what they're working on. We think that would be acceptable, and we are very much supportive of of having that passed and be able to be able to take the rate structure to that level. As a point of comparison, if it goes to 110% of Medicare reimbursement, what would the current percentage compared to Medicare reimbursement be? Any idea? Is it 50%, 80%, 10%? It's let's see. It's it's far far worse than Medicaid and Medicaid is far worse than Medicare. So it's 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 perhaps half of Medicare now. I, I'd have to do the math, but it's it's ballpark. That's fine. It's it's pretty far off. Is 110 percent of Medicare competitive with with uh, Virginia and Maryland? Um, I don't know their their state um, their state plans, but if you look at it as a as a comparison to commercial payers, mm -hmm. commercial payers are are usually, you know, maybe. 150, 170, 200 percent of Medicare. So it's not terribly competitive with commercial rates, but it's so much better than where we've been. And, and I think I think we can we would find it acceptable. When you say commercial, what do you mean in this case? Blue Cross, okay, Aetna, okay, Humana. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay. Yes. So between under reimbursed care and charity care, what's that number on an annual basis for? Um, for your system here in Martinsburg. Do you have any idea? Well, um, we do put together a community need assessment okay. and, and we do assess, you know, the, the charity care and, and, and what we're essentially providing to the community. Teresa, do you recall offhand? I don't remember the dollar amount for 2022. I don't think I've seen that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's fairly, I mean, it's astronomical it's, what you do. Oh, millions. And, yeah, yes. yeah. and I, again, I, I'm not sure that um, that people quite understand, especially the numbers of folks who use the ER as their primary um, care system and just go in there and they can't pay and you have to treat and um, and yeah, it's it's problematic. So. Yeah, there it's a it's a, it's a very high number really for every not-for-profit health system mm -hmm. ac across the country and we certainly um, I think do a lot in, in that regard and and we're we're proud of supporting the community but but it is a, a, a burden on, on on the health system. Let's talk about expansion. We're talking by the way with Dean Thomas, President and CEO of WV Medicine, Teresa McCabe uh, as well and uh, I People text me and they say that the, they need more beds at the hospital, they need more doctors at the hospital, they need more space at the hospital. So let's talk about expansion based on the needs and the growth of this community. What do you need to provide everything that you would require to serve this growing area in Berkeley County, Dean? More square footage, another building? 
How many more doctors? You tell me. Yeah, no, that really great question. So we are on a, a dramatic um, expansion plan. So we we put together a five year strategic plan, but and that back that was approved back in the middle of 2021. So we've had 18 months um, uh, of work against that plan, and we mm-hmm. we've put a lot of uh, we put a lot of things in place. When I kind of came on board, what we saw is we had great needs for space and for capital investment across really all aspects of our of our organization. Both hospitals needed significant capital investment, and our ambulatory network needed significant capital investment. Uh, we it really starts from the ambulatory side, and we you know we need to serve our community and get people access to their primary care docs in a timely basis. Access uh, to get in you know wait times for clinic appointments are just too long, um, and so we've been working very diligently on that. Uh, most of our uh, strategic plans that we've put in place here over the the last eighteen months have been about expanding um, access in to clinic space. So the Dorothy McCormick expansion, we're building out the third level of our Spring Mills building to expand our Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. That will free up space in one of our other medical office buildings to add more doctors. So essentially, we're really working on the ambulatory side because uh, trying to the wait times to try to get in to see doctors is, is just too long. Your predecessor, uh, one of your predecessors, had uh, going converting from a multiple bed or two bed unit to a single bed unit as a very high priority. I gather what you just said, that uh, ambulatory now is the number one priority. What does that say, what does that speak to the conversion to single bed units? Uh, another great question. So with with what I saw, particularly at Berkeley Medical Center, we had a tremendous amount of our inpatient space being occupied by administrative services and outpatient services that could move out and so we've been moving them out we bought a we bought a building and developed that as a corporate center on edwin miller uh, Teresa's office is there now so we've been able to move our administrative functions out of the hospital because that's precious space for inpatient care so what we're doing is maximizing the inpatient space that we already have in that building by clearing out the things that can be in other locations and then the next step to that actually that we have slated for 2026 is to build a new tower on the Berkeley Medical Center campus. We we have the the planning for that. There's a space kind of a placeholder in our in our system uh, strategic capital plan for that new tower, and that will be a big focus of our planning efforts in the next couple of years to 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 get that really solid. So that will allow us, I believe, with the addition of that tower to to convert to all sing, all private rooms. How many so, floors are we talking about? At this point, we're thinking probably two to three levels of parking deck and three levels of, of clinical care. Good, Bill. So, yeah, so the target timeline for uh, conversion, fully conversion, single bed would be what, five years, six years? Um, that 2026 is probably the timeline at this point. Okay. So, we're, you know, maybe three years out. Before Good. we run out of time, let's talk golf tournament, <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much. You're very uh, welcome. I yes. saw you sitting there patiently. <laughs> Thank you, uh, which is hard for me sometimes. But let me just add that we, Dean Pye doesn't even know this yet, but it's on his calendar. We, <laughs> we set a date yesterday for the ribbon cutting open house for the new HVI. Uh, unit um, that's going to be May the 11th. Uh, we're going to incorporate that into Hospital Week. Make we sure you Dr. say what HVI stands for. Heart and Vascular Institute. You're, and you're we welcome. have even Dr. <laughs> Badoirs coming down from Morgantown. Some of our folks from Morgantown, so we're very excited um, about that and to show off that space. Yep. Um, but moving on, yes, <laughs> our 36th annual Bernie Hutzler Golf Classic is scheduled for Monday, June 5th at the Woods. Mm-hmm. We're very excited. In fact, there's a, a, one of our, uh, uh, we have a meeting going on now um, of our committee so uh, we're working out all the details but very excited we're back to normal um, we were last year uh, when we held it at Crest Creek the proceeds this year are going to go to um, our emergency departments at both hospitals um, we have some equipment needs there and certainly we know our emergency departments have been extremely busy I was going <laughs> to say so just, that yes. I'm going to get this in here too so what about that piece you hear sort of anecdotally that you know that there are no beds so they're in the emergency somebody's in the er for x number of hours and um and so on is that accurate or um what do you think it it it, it has been uh particularly through the pandemic through Mm -hmm. pandemic surges Mm -hmm. where we've just had 
um, you know, a, a large number of people coming through the ED, and not everybody needs to be admitted. Absolutely. So we're we're holding some of those patients, assessing what you know whether we can. Um, get them stable and allow them to discharge back to home versus having to admit them. Okay. And one of the things that we're doing to make that a better experience, frankly, is part of one of our current projects. When we expand our perioperative area, we're also going to move the lab and that's going to free up space on the first level to build out an observation unit. So nice. rather than having, you know, patients that have to hold in the ED, they will be able to be seen and treated in a in a much nicer observation space in their own room, a private room um, to be assessed. And then ultimately the determination whether they need to be admitted or whether they can be discharged home. Right. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, back to the golf tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. No, so we I'm are. I'm going to be turning Maria's mic off we, now. <laughs> we are currently <laughs> recruiting sponsors for that event and players. So mm -hmm. if anybody's interested, you can go to our website, our foundation website, or uh, just you know give us a call at three zero four two six four one two two three. And how many golfers do you have room for this year? Oh, we're at the woods, so we could have two hundred and fifty or now, more. In, yeah. in the past, Teresa, the winner of the golf tournament has directed where the money would go, but mm -hmm. you've already predetermined where the money would go. And Bill, That's thank you for staying on the theme of the golf tournament. <laughs> well, it, is, it, is a, it is a golf Several tournament. It is a golf then, tournament. Yes. I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody else in the room. No, I'm just thanking It you. is a golf tournament. Actually, before the pandemic, the committee yeah. made a decision that it makes more sense to identify where the money's going to go when you're trying to solicit support from the community yeah. because of the appeal. It's much more appealing. So, yes, so we had to change that tradition, Bill, right. but you are correct. Right. The winning team we would give them a list of projects and they would mention to mention to Rob that I was correct would you <laughs> Rob he was correct I've, I've got that recorded too though, so I and I can't that. say anything you know, <laughs> your mic's off I know my mic's off the other, same loop. and if you'd like to be a sponsor of the <laughs> tournament how do you do that Teresa as I said um, you can actually go to our foundation website mm -hmm. um, on our WV Medicine Berkeley Medical Center Jefferson Medical Center, Center page and um, you can sign up there or you can and email me or call our office. And a minute left, what else would you like to promote coming up? Uh, well, we have our Children's Gala is back. Um, we're holding that April 15th at the Holiday Inn. Mm -hmm. um, that is very popular, and normally um, sponsorships are going well. That money will benefit our uh, pediatric units, our NICU, and then um, our OB units at both hospitals. So we're very excited um, about that event and it sells out unfortunately so we need a large venue uh, around here for um, special events so and anybody are you, out are there are you doing the tennis tournament again this we year? are that's always the second saturday in september yes okay, very good <laughs> hey uh anything else any final thoughts i don't think so i don't think so i you guys asked a lot of great questions i really appreciate the time this morning